We are so thrilled because, and so grateful to be joined by right now by Dr. Jonathan Tarbox. He is the head of research and development here at the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. You're also the director of the Autism Research Group. That's correct. Um, and all around, just a really nice guy who's incredibly <laughs> knowledgeable in the field of autism. How long have you been working in the field of autism? I guess about 13 years now. Uh, amazing what this gentleman can tell you. And, and I have to say, too, that you say things in a way that parents get and it's not just me you guys write in and say this and I've heard parents say that they've gone to hear you speak and they say oh my goodness somebody who speaks and we understand what well, he says thank you very much I appreciate it it's a high compliment is what it is it's a very high compliment <laughs> and we need we need more of you can you <laughs> can you clone, clone yourself sure. and, Cloning, okay no problem um, but so uh, dr. Tart box joins us regularly on Fridays and to talk about different things you answer your questions and you can ask questions right Right now, but in particular today, you have brought, brought some research to share with us, and I love when you talk about the research because you understand things that I won't. Well, we'll, <laughs> we'll see about that. This is okay. a genetic study, so I don't understand a whole lot. But okay, uh, but let me give you the basic overview of what I do understand. Please. So uh, this is a study that just came out by. Uh, let me see if I don't botch this name, Scafidas and colleagues at the University of Melbourne in Australia. Okay. Uh, and what they did was they looked at, uh, there's been lots of genetic research on autism and frankly not a whole ton of progress in that area. Uh, and so these folks made a pretty significant breakthrough. What they did was they looked at um, genetic characteristics of a few thousand people with autism mm -hmm. and compared it to a few thousand people who don't have autism, okay. <clears throat> autism spectrum disorders in general. Right. Um, and what they found was uh, they looked at single, single nucleotide polymorphisms, uh, otherwise known as SNPs, mm -hmm. uh, which are partic particular genetic characteristics, essentially. Right. Uh, and what they did was they looked at all these different SNPs and tried to identify SNPs that were associated with having an autism diagnosis. What they're trying to do is develop a genetic test for autism. Okay? Right. Um, and what they, what they actually found was, I believe it was 237 SNPs, that if you have these particular SNPs, it was 71% um, accurate diagnosis of, or I'm sorry, not diagnosis, but classification of whether or not you have an autism spectrum disorder. Okay. So the, the, basically the short summary here is they developed a genetic test, blood test, that um, in 71% of t cases will tell you, yes, this person either has an ASD or does not, and 71% of cases that that decision is accurate. Okay, and 71% is pretty significant, right? right? I mean, it's not 100%, and right. we, need to, we need to make that clear, but it's pretty significant. It's very, very high. It's miles beyond anything that had been done previously, and quite frankly, plenty of clinicians, like if you just take your kid to a medical doctor, mm -hmm. I'm not sure that their diagnostic accuracy is gonna be much better than 71%. Okay, well that's someone, important to know too. Yeah, absolutely. Now, for someone who's an experienced diagnostician, has been doing it for years, and who really has proper training and experience, they're going to be way better than 71%. And that's right. really the gold standard is, is someone who's, you know, very experienced, trained in diagnosis and has been doing it for years and uses some, some sort of gold standard diagnostic tools like the ADOS or the ADIR. Mm -hmm. um, but this genetic uh, piece is a real nice addition. And the, probably the most exciting part of it is that it's going to allow us to identify kids that are at risk or at high risk or very right. likely to develop an ASD later on. Yeah. Because that's what I want to move into next is talking about, okay, so here we have this information now and how are we going to apply it. So ostensibly, if you have a child who's on the spectrum right now and you're concerned because you just had another child or you're thinking of having another child, this could give you a leg up right. because a child could have their genetic testing done very early, as early as, you know, I mean, right fresh out of the womb yeah, and know, yeah. um, have the genetic testing to suggest to you whether this child is significant significantly at risk. Right. Yeah. It's not going to be entirely definitive. Right. But but quite a bit more definitive than most things. Like for example, right. if you have a history of heart disease in your family, that puts you at higher risk. Right. But that's not a 71% accurate prediction. Right. right? That's nowhere near. Uh, so this is uh, really a lot more uh, solid information than that you than you've been able to get really from anything else in the past in terms of predicting is my new baby going to develop an ASD or not. And that information could lead to we talk 
talk about early intervention and how important it is to get there That's right. uh, you know, as early as possible and if not possibly ahead of the curve before they get behind on something. Absolutely. And so we could possibly be starting doing therapy with a child that's three weeks old to make sure that they are reinforced by human contact. Right. Now, no one's developed any procedures to actually implement with a child as young as, say, three weeks. But yeah, there's there's huge implications there. And we have worked with children as young as maybe nine or 10 months. Right. Um, and there's no reason why we couldn't push the envelope further and further back, as right. you say. It would take some research and take some time to develop what's an appropriate procedure to address which particular concerns and what do the concerns look like at such a young age. But if you have that genetic test that says you're at way higher risk, um, then that would be a, a critical piece of information to, you know, yeah. to put you on alert. Because in, in all likelihood, you could be preventing the child from getting behind. Right, exactly. And, and we don't know in what percentage of cases that you would be able to do that successfully. Right. But just, um, <clears throat> just anecdotally, kids that we've started under the age of one, mm -hmm. almost 100% of them were able to catch up to typical right. development and they're done. Right. So I don't know if you even call that recovery because we started before they even had a diagnosis usually. Right. right? Um, maybe it's kind of more like prevention. Right. I'm not sure exactly what you want to call it. It's any word you attach to it. I call it getting there beforehand. Right. Getting there just, beforehand. Yeah. 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 It's just early intervention. Just help the kid yeah. as, as soon as possible so that you have the least amount of work to do. And possible. I think any parent who's gone through the nightmare could see the benefit in that. Absolutely. Of getting yeah, there beforehand. No but also, and, and we, we were talking just before we came on the air, and we were saying, you know, it may not be of much use to parents who have a child on the spectrum. And I was saying, but now wait a second, because so often, you know, people go to get a diagnosis. And for me, when I went through that experience, it was not not that difficult. Mm -hmm. I was able to go to my HMO and say I had to wait three months and I'm saying wow. that this was not a difficult um, thing. I had to wait three months and went and my insurance covered it to meet with this person who wrote the piece of paper who said autism. Okay. But my funding source would not take that as gospel. So I had to wait another three months and go to another person and lived in panic right. of, is this person going to corroborate? Right. Right. Or is this person going to say it's PDD NOS, which the funding source was not right. going to fund? Right. I mean, it was the one day that I was like saying, looking at my child and saying, please have a bad day. Please have a bad day, yeah. Because by that point, I knew we weren't going to get funding unless right. he was classified as autism. I already right. had the diagnosis, but it wasn't going to count towards anything. Right. Um, so to be able to go to the funding source and say, and uh, here we have genetic corroboration that this child is something that maybe can help parents. Yeah, it could, it could potentially. I mean, it's not 100% yet, so they could always argue, well, maybe they're part of that 30% of error, you know? Right. So it's, yeah, sure, it says they have autism, but 30% of the time the test is wrong, you know? So it's it's tough to say yet, but, but, but it certainly couldn't hurt. But where ABA is concerned, we know that it helps a child to learn and progress. That's right. And so, and we also know, I mean, studies have shown that if you have a child who gets early intervention, the amount of money it's gonna cost to do that early intervention is going to be far lower than the amount of money if they didn't get the intervention and were living in the system That's as right. an adult. That's right. Millions of dollars less. Yeah, it's a big save. So if we got to the point where as a society that we could say, well, we're identifying these children at risk, making sure that they have this because we know it's going to cost us less. That's right. And we prevented an, a, a group of children from getting behind it could be brilliant. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm, could I'm, be, it could I'm be, seeing just heaven. It could here. be huge. It could be cost effective. It could prevent <clears throat> stress. It could prevent suffering. It could, yeah, it could be yeah. very important. And could be some peace of mind for some parents going into having a second child and not, you know, we had a woman on the show, um, Vena Tierro, who is a documentary filmmaker, and she had her first child and he was progressing normally. And then, you know, he stopped progressing normally and started losing skills. Mm -hmm. And it was right at the period of time when she was becoming a single mom mm -hmm. and so there was a lot of stress and she all they just had the second baby and the second baby was just 
you know, she was noting the difference between the first and the mm -hmm. two. But while she was in the process of getting the first one services, the second one slipped, regressed uh, into autism much uh, wow. worse. Wow. Much worse. So that by the time services started for the first one and she was, you know, doing the surveys about what can your child do and taking assessments, she realized, oh, my first child, who I was so concerned about, can do some of this, but my second child can't do any of this. Wow. That's really scary. And I think about somebody like that and what kind of a difference it could make it could have made in her life that's right that's a really good point um, you know to have to know uh, and I think more and more people are starting to look at parents who have a first child and say let's make sure we're careful with the second child um, but you know word doesn't get around everywhere Absolutely. maybe this could make a difference and even if you know to look out and know to be careful it's still very challenging as a parent I mean you you know you're not a clinician you're not a diagnostician right. you're just living your life you know I mean how are you supposed to know what looks right. weird versus doesn't look weird or how you know it's, right. it's incredibly challenging for parents so yeah anything that can give an extra piece of information as to you know you really need to be on the lookout could be very useful and you know not just for parents I mean if, if you know if the if the system the whatever you, you know depending on where you are, whether it's the regional centers or educational system or whatever it is, or medical system, had that red flag at birth that said, look, there's 70% chance uh, that this kid is going to develop an ASD. Things should be done differently for that kid, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Um, and so, yeah, it should it should help the child access effective treatment as early as possible. There was a study that we were talking about the other day on the show, and of course, I don't have the information in front of me, but a study that talked about uh, they were looking at children who were at risk because they had older siblings mm -hmm. that were on the spectrum, and what they discovered was that they could see uh, at risk behavior right. much earlier than they had previously thought. Yep. Uh, and I think you know maybe everybody is starting to look at those kinds of things and see how much earlier. I know you and I had had a conversation about, and I, I still want to get them on the show, about a couple of women in, I think, Riverside mm -hmm. um, that are, are trying to work with children who are significantly younger um, to see what they can do um, to, to make a difference. So we'll have to make sure that we have them on the show. Sounds good. Okay. Uh, but this, thank you for bringing this to our attention. Obviously, this is not something we can run out and do right now. Right. Yeah. It's not commercially available that I know of. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also important for your viewers to keep in mind that this is the very first study. Uh, nothing really exists in science until it's been replicated. That's one of the okay. mantras of science is replication. So this group did it. It made an amazing discovery. It's very likely legitimate. But now another group has to go that's unaffiliated with this group has to go and try to get the same results. Um, and if they do, then at that point we start to say, okay, this is real. You know, it's not just, um, you know, specific to their lab or their procedures. Right. It's anyone who looks at these specific uh, SNPs should find the same thing. And then I imagine when it first starts, it's going to be something that's, you know, how, how many years away from that? I, I don't know how far we are, but when it does start, it's going to be rudely expensive for a while before it comes down in price. A lot of this genetic testing can be very expensive. Yeah, even, um, even after insurance covers their part, the copay or the the, the co-insurance could be up to you know seven hundred a thousand dollars so it's quite expensive yeah okay well something we'll keep an eye on and thank you for making a, uh, us aware of it because it gives me a great deal of hope that we're moving in a direction that might be useful <laughs>